as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house, the whole house where they were sitting. So the Holy Spirit showed up in dramatic fashion on this occasion. had a question is um, when it's when they're talking about um, there appeared to them divided tongues what is that what does that mean so we're talking about language so again it is is a visual of what was happening and so it was like as if fire uh, that's just dramatic language to get your attention this was something that was noticed if you were there you, you couldn't help but understand something was going on and so God does this in a very dramatic fashion. And each of the persons who, uh, the apostles, were able to speak in an unknown tongue. Because we got a multitude of folk there on this day that need to hear the word of God. And so God miraculously equips the apostles so that they can speak to these people so they will hear the gospel message. And I, and I think that's a good lesson for us to understand that as you know, as congregations grow and they get diversified and you get people of all nationalities there, there you got to be conscious of, that the word is able to be communicated in a way they can understand. So if we were to become a multi-racial, uh, cultural congregation, and we had people here of all abilities, I mean, not all abilities, but people who spoke multiple languages, then we've got to be consi considered of that when it comes to the teaching and preaching. We're going to have to get somebody up here who can teach and in those languages so that those people can hear, or we got to invest in some technology so that we can have somebody transmit what is being said by whatever the speaker in a way that they understand. And part of the reason congregations don't grow that have multiple ethnicities in it today is that we don't know how to expand to deal with the audience that shows up. So if we had people here whose primary uh, language was Spanish, we got to find somebody up in here who speaks Spanish. We got to put my material uh, in, in the Spanish so people can read it. And so it may be, it may look like uh, I'm up teaching or preaching, and somebody's standing next to me who's interpreting everything I'm saying, so that people who speak those languages can understand it. Make sense? So again, on this on this occasion, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and guides the teaching and preaching of these men so they can speak the truth. And not only that, uh, the Holy Spirit comes and allows for this visual signs to catch people's attention. When things happen, they catch people's attention. Okay? So on last Wednesday, when the ruckus happened at the Capitol, did that not catch everybody's attention? And I would imagine that some uh, church buildings, that was the topic uh, for their Bible study. Because here is a teachable moment where you get a chance to expand on some of these Christian principles that we've been learning. Here becomes a perfect model of how not to do some things. And so again, God uses the miraculous in the first century to get people's attention so that his word can be advanced. So in Acts chapter 2, you got all those nationalities present. The word is preached. People hear it in their own language. So now when it comes to what must I do to be saved, they know. Now if you got nearly 3,000 that are baptized, you know you got a huge multitude there. 3,000 came out of whatever that number was. How do you think they baptized them? One by one? Did they do some mass baptism? We don't know. And that's really not the important. What's important is that that number responded to the gospel, and they were added to the church. And it helps us to understand that when the word is properly and people understand, people will respond. Even when you have people in the audience who don't necessarily speak same language. If this, if the gospel is communicated with them, the response will be the same. 
So now I want to transition to Acts chapter 10. Holy Spirit comes on the apostles. But in Acts chapter 10, we're going to see something different that the Holy Spirit does. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. Acts chapter 10, verses 44 through 48. I need a reader. yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word, and they of the circumcision that believed were amazed, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter an- then answered Peter, Can any man forbid the water that these should not be baptized? He hath received the Holy Spirit as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then prayed they then prayed they him to tarry certain days certain days. Okay, read them again. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all them that heard the word, and they of the circumcision that believed were amazed, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also were poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then answered Peter, Can any man forbid the water that these should not be baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Okay, so what's going on here from from the reading that we just heard? What's going on here? Okay, it involves Cornelius. I'll give you a hint. We talked about Cornelius many times in Bible class. So what's going on? Okay, I'll give you another hint. It involves the Gentiles. What's going on here? Okay, that that's part of it. That's true. But something happened before before that. Okay, but we gotta we gotta deal with what happens first. Uh, Monique, I saw your hand. In the in the verses, I saw that Peter was teaching them. Um, so first of all, he came there with Jews. Peter was there with other Jews, mm-hmm. and um, at that time, obviously, they thought that the, that Christ was for heathen, and so with these Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit, um, that was like a confirmation for everybody that was there that Jesus was not extending or the the. His ministry is extended to Gentiles as well as Jews. Okay. So now now we have the coming of the Holy Spirit on Gentiles. Before, it was just on Jews. And you know how Jews felt about Gentiles. They didn't feel they were worth anything. They just spewed to go to hell. So here God, in his very public demonstration, allows the same Holy Spirit that the apostles and others, uh, that, that, that the apostles had received to fall on the Gentiles. So once God does what only God can do, the question becomes, now, who can forbid these people from being baptized? If they are acceptable to God, they ought to be acceptable to you. So we got, we got the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit falls on them, but we got water baptism later. So they weren't saved simply because the Holy Spirit came upon them. In the text it says, uh, verse 47, can anyone... For, for, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? Verse 4, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So, Holy Spirit falls on them. They're not saved. Holy Spirit is there to, uh, to demonstrate they are acceptable to God just like you Jews. Then some teaching goes on and they're baptized in water. That's important because people will read that and say, well, they, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but keep reading. Keep reading. And then understand why they received that so that the Jews would know Gentiles are acceptable to God. They're taught some more, and then they go find some water and baptize these folks, Cornelius and his household. 
So the Holy Spirit comes upon them, gives a visible witness that these people are acceptable to God. And when you think about it, God had to do all of that because the, the church at the very beginning was just Jewish. It had nothing but Jews in it. And if it had been left up to the Jews, that's how it would have stayed. That's why uh, God allows persecution to come. I believe it's Acts chapter 8. And they are scattered. Guess what? If they hadn't been scattered, they would have stayed in Jerusalem. Sometimes God has to allow something to happen to get us going and doing what we should have been doing. Because if you go back to the beginning of Acts, uh, that's the map that God gives us. It was going to start in Jerusalem, but it wasn't going to stay in Jerusalem. And so too many times when it comes to evangelism, we stay where we're comfortable. Until something happens to make us uncomfortable, then we start expanding. So again, uh, the Holy Spirit shows up in this occasion to help us to begin to understand these people are worthy of the blessings of God just like Jews are. Okay. Right, so the key becomes what is mentioned in verse number 44. And while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. So something happened. The Holy Spirit did something so that people began to see his working with them. And so there's nothing specifically said about how that occurred or whatever. It is uh, as Peter was teaching, preaching, the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so we can speculate on maybe what they were doing, uh, but we, sh we shouldn't. Because the, the point of the passage is to simply help people understand that God's spirit is available to everybody. All you got to do is be willing to submit to the will of God. Good question, brother. Uh, only the apostles could pass on miraculous gifts. I want to look at... Uh, Two passages in Acts chapter 8. Uh, Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. Acts chapter 8, verses 14 through 17. And then Acts chapter 8, verses 5 through uh, 8. I need a reader for Acts chapter 8, starting in verse number 14. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem, <laughs> now when, sorry, I didn't, now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John. who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Read, it, read them again, verses 14 and 17. Mm -hmm. Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them, and that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For they had not yet fallen upon any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. 
Okay, so what's what's happening here? What, what's what's happening here? You guys heard the, the passage read twice, and plus you guys have the scriptures in advance, so you should have already gone over these scriptures. You, uh, this shouldn't be the first time you're hearing them in class. What's going on? All right. Even though he was a Christian, a preacher, mm-hmm. when even though they were saved, they were they believed, they he could not pass on any kind of a gift to them. So they had to send back for uh, Peter and John. Okay, okay, good. So who are Peter and John? Okay, who I, I want to hear with confidence. Who are Peter and John? They're apostles. Now, why are they going to Samaria? Uh, verse number 14 gives us a reason for why they were there. They had heard that Samaria had received the word of God, and so they sent the apostles. Okay, who are Samaritans? Gentiles. So we still have another situation where the word of God is reaching non-Jewish populations. And God has to step in to authenticate this. So in this case, in order to verify this, they sent the apostles. They sent two of the apostles down there to, to see what was going on. Because, again, we're dealing with Gentiles. We're dealing with people who weren't a part of the covenant. And we're hearing that they're being saved. But you got to remember, in the mind of the ancient Jew, they, they, they wouldn't understand that. They would not have put the Gentile on the same level as, as themselves. So the apostles are hearing that the word of God is being, teach there, uh, being taught there. Text will say they came down that they could transmit or help people to understand the Holy Spirit. Uh, as the Bible says, they pray for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For as yet, he had not fallen upon them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord. So they had only received water baptism. They didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. So again, we have God doing some things with a Gentile population to, again, establish that these people are just as important to me as you Jews. And so he does it in such a way that nobody could deny that God is at work here. And so verse number 17 will say, they, the apostles, Peter and John, laid hands on those, some of those people, and guess what? They received the Holy Spirit. Now, again, special things are being done here. And, and sometimes it's hard for us to understand that in light of what we teach in Acts chapter 2. But you've got to remember, uh, the, the, when, the, when the church was established, it was a primarily Gentile organization. So you got people, the word has to spread out to all these other communities so that people understand the gospel message. And then when it starts spreading in areas that Jews would not have thought it would have been going in, that they might not think these are legitimate or authentic Christians, God has to step in and say, yes, they are. And so he does some things differently with these individuals to get everybody's attention. Uh, verses 5 through 8 in the same chapter. 5 through 8 in Acts chapter 8, same chapter. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were, and lame were healed, and there was great joy in that city. So what is Philip doing here? What's that? You got anything else? 
Okay? First thing, verse number 5 says, he goes there to preach or proclaim Christ to them. He goes out teaching the gospel. Verse 6 says, some of the people who he was preaching to, they heard what he said, uh, and seeing the miracles that were done, all of that helped them to come to believe. Now, who is Philip? Who, who is Philip? I thought somebody would say that. No, he isn't. He's not an apostle. He's a preacher. Okay, let's go back to Acts chapter 6. Go back to Acts chapter 6, and someone read verse number 5. Acts chapter 6, verse number 5. multitude and they chose Stephen a man filled of faith and the Holy Spirit and Philip Prochorus and um, these names Nazir Tintin Panamus and Nicholas the <coughs> Perstyle from the Artok. Okay so we'll, we'll excuse your reading but <laughs> the, the point is here here's where we meet Philip he was one of those men that had one of those men who had been selected to help with this issue at Jerusalem when it came to the neglecting of uh, widows. That same, pre uh, so the same Philip not only does that, but later on God uses him as a preacher to proclaim the gospel to the Gentiles. And that's how he gets there. So the, uh, the point I was going to ask is how, how is he able uh, to perform miracles? Say it again? Okay, need the mic for her, please. The apostle laid hand on him. Yeah, obviously the apostles had laid hands on him in order for him to have this ability to do that. And so I, I, I want to use that to undergird this whole idea. The apostles could perform miracles and people that they laid hands on could. That's why in the same uh, chapter of Acts chapter 8, you'll see Simon the sorcerer seeing this ability, and he wants to buy it. First crooked preacher. <laughs> he wants to use this. He was a sorcerer. So he wanted to buy this ability so he could overwhelm the people and whatnot. But again, God, God is able to use and appoint people to perform miraculous measures for his purpose. And he did that because, again, the gospel message is being established. It was established with the Jews, but it also had to be established with the Gentiles in multiple places because you had Gentiles scattered in multiple cities. And the goal uh, of all of that is to say to Jews, uh, these people are acceptable to me. They need to be acceptable to you. And so you evangelize them and you help them. You minister to them just like you would any Jew. And we need to understand that message today. Uh, we minister, we help all Christians, whether they look like us or not. The common denominator is that we're all Christians. And so if we can help somebody, we help someone, regardless of skin tone. So we've established that the Holy Spirit came and these miraculous uh, gifts and abilities were there. But scripture will help us understand, but those things were not designed to last forever. So when the last apostle died, so did these gifts. The apostles were the ones who were baptized with the Holy Spirit. They had the ability to lay hands on people and transfer uh, these gifts. When the last person the apostles laid hands on died, so did these gifts. So the apostles were able to lay hands on people and pass on gifts. When the apostles died, there was nobody else to pass that on to anybody. The individuals that they touched who had that ability, guess what? When they died, who else is going to do this? There is nobody else to do it. And so that's why the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is so important. And so if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 
verses 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. And so what people in our contemporary churches don't understand is the miraculous measures or, or, or miraculous gifts were never intended to be permanent. They served a purpose when the church was being established. They served a purpose when the gospel was just uh, being uh, spread across the world. They helped to authenticate, to verify that the men who are saying what they're saying, these people have been sent by God. They are authorized. Now, what does 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through, 8 through 10 say? Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. Okay, read them, read them again. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless, but love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete, and even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. But when the time of perfection comes, these partial things will become useless. Okay, now walk with me through... Verse number 8 in your translation. I like the way it reads. So go slow. Verse, verse number 8. Prophecy and speaking in unknown languages and special knowledge will become useless. You guys see that? Mm -hmm. your, your translation says it will cease. Mm -hmm. They serve a purpose, but that purpose was never to be continuous. What else does it say? But love will last forever. Now our knowledge is partial and incomplete. And even the gift of prophecy reveals only part of the whole picture. Okay. So instead of us craving miraculous measures, being able to do this, that, or the other, what Paul says is we need to be concerned about loving folk. We need to be concerned about caring for those who can't care for themselves and not focus on doing things that bring attention to ourselves. It is about ministering to those who are in need. And so that's why he would say love never fails. You, you want to be involved in something that has long-term benefit? Start loving folk. Start, start just loving them. And you will have something to do until the day you die. Not only that, but you have something to keep you busy and occupied. So you won't be gossiping, backbiting, being a busybody. Trying to run other folk business. Find folk that you can love. And the reality is you will not run out of potential recipients if that is what your focus is on. Because too many times we get focused on the showy and that which is out front. And, and we do that because we want attention. But the real job of someone who's following Jesus is to be like Jesus. Let's love people. Let's do all we can to bring people into a saving relationship with Jesus. And you have your hands full right there. And so the miraculous measures or gifts uh, from the very beginning were not intended to be here forever. And if we follow the logic that God gave those gifts to the apostles, and then the apostles were able to transfer them to uh, individuals, uh, and once the apostles were no longer here, once the individuals that those gifts were transferred to were no longer here, there was no more uh, miraculous gifts. Now, again, you will have people who say, I can speak in tongues and all those kinds of things. Uh, and what I'll say is do not argue with them, folk. You can convince yourself of anything. You don't believe me? Let's go to Washington. So a person can convince themselves of anything. It doesn't have to be true, and it, but they may believe it. And so since we know what the word says, our job is to teach people not to get bogged down in arguments. You can't force anybody to believe anything, but we can share the truth of the message of God with people. And once we have done that, we are demonstrating love. So moving forward, stop arguing with folk. Uh, just simply share the word of God. Now, I don't have a watch, and the clock on the wall is wrong. 
So somebody's going to need to let me know when it's about 1040. Oh, oh, eight minutes? Okay. So I'll just deal with questions now. Uh, Butch? Yeah, because I'm through with that segment. I was going to go to a, another topic. One of them, no. Sorry. One, one question I had was like, uh, like blasphemy against the, the Holy Spirit. So, you know, that's mentioned in the Bible as one sin that is like not forgivable. Right. So that's obviously something like we all want to stay away from. And I don't know that I have a, comp what I would say, a solid understanding of what exactly that means. But I know that in Matthew, which is where it's mentioned, it's brought up in the context of Jesus casting out demons. Right. And the people who witnessed this miracle said, God didn't do that. Right. And, you know, they say that, you know, this must be by the power of Beelzebub or whatever. And then Jesus talks about, you know, not blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Right. So sometimes I, like, I wonder if part of blaspheming the Holy Spirit is doubting the power of God, like doubting what God did or when God does something, not giving credit where credit is due. Mm -hmm. And that can be really difficult in today's world when you've got a lot of deceivers out there, mm -hmm. a lot of people who are pretenders. And, you know, I, I think that a lot of the, the healing that, you know, you hear about or see on TV, I, I think a lot of it is fake, but a lot of that is kind of my, uh, you know, my, my own skepticism, my own doubt, because I think, you know, a lot of people just kind of, you know, they're, they're in the business of ministry, you know, mm -hmm. because of, you know, the perceived power and the attention and all of that right. and may not have God's will. But I guess I'm I'm reticent to say that no one can perform miracles because okay. I feel like if I say that, like I'm doubting what God could do. Okay. So like if someone tells me, you know, I was able to heal someone, I'm not going to like go and s argue, like you said, argue with that person. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to say, no, God didn't do that because I don't. I don't want to blaspheme the Holy Spirit if God really did do that. Okay. But at the same time, you know, you bring up a good point. Like, you know, why doesn't this person go to the hospitals and heal everybody? Because there are a lot of sick people. And I think people like that, if, if you ask them, well, why don't you go around healing everybody? It's, uh, you know, they might say, well, you know, it's I just heal, you know, when God wants it to happen. Right. <laughs> and... <laughs> How is that, and I wonder how is that different from, like, if I pray for somebody, God, would you heal this person? Okay. And then God does it. Right. So, l so let, me, let, me, let me jump in. <coughs> yeah, yeah. Because while God has stopped using men directly to do miracles, God still does miracles. Amen. So God may use a surgeon when somebody goes into the operating room, but God did that. We want to credit the surgeon, your, his skill, his education. No, that was God doing that. So, so, so God is still able. You see people uh, who are able to lift heavy vehicles when people are trapped in them. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you, you can barely lift 50 pounds, but now this person is able to do that. God did that. God empowered the person. So, so I, I am not saying that God is not at work doing things. Mm -hmm. he, he is. But he's not doing his work today like he did with the apostles. And that's what people need to understand. Uh, and so when we pray for somebody, even here in our worship service, we pray for somebody who is going through whatever, and God restores them. Right. Let's recognize God restores them and not take, well, my prayers are so magical that if I pray for you, good stuff is going to happen. Uh. No. God does that. Amen. We're simply asking him, interceding on somebody's behalf, but God is the one with the power. And we know God well enough that we know whenever there's a problem, let's go to him. He can fix it. And so then going back to what your initial said about blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So, so you set it up well based on the Matthew passage. So denying clear evidence of God at being at work, that's blasphemy. And you're not going to be forgiven of that. Now, the likelihood of you and I seeing Jesus or God doing something like that today, and then we give him credit to the devil for that, but that's not likely. But we learn from that, that passage of what people did in the first century to not doubt God. Satan wants us to doubt God. 
That's one of the reasons why churches that can meet during COVID aren't meeting, because they're doubting God. But these same folk go everywhere else they want to go. But you act like you're going to die if you go to a church building. And so the same God that takes care of me when I go to shop and shop <laughs> will take care of me in a worship service or a Bible class. Same God that takes care of me when I stop and put gas in my car at a machine that a thousand people have touched before I get there will, will keep me safe here. And so it's not blind faith because I'm going to have my mask on and socially distance and wipe stuff off and all of that. But I'm trusting God. And what we need to do more of is simply trust God. Follow common sense measures and whatnot, but recognize that the glory all goes to God. The fact that many of us have not been infected with, with COVID, that's God doing. Because we all know folk who have been infected. So you ought to be thankful and say, God, why didn't you let me get infected? Well, there's a reason. Talk to God about it and find out why. But good question. Uh, anything else you want to add on to that, or is that was it? Well, just kind of building on my thoughts about it is you know, sometimes people can have a different perspective of the same thing. Like, you know, you talk about, you know, the surgeons and the, the, the doctors and, you know, someone having a, what we would call a miraculous recovery. Now, mm -hmm. you know, someone with more faith might say God did that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you know, someone maybe who doesn't believe in God will just, you know, talk to you about cells and, and biology. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's some sort of coincidence that, you know, it happened seemingly overnight that this person got better. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, just kind of that difference in perspective. So, you know, I, I don't want to say that everyone who believes that they have the power of healing is necessarily like someone who is intentionally trying to deceive people. Like right. they might be you know, someone who is well-meaning with good intentions right. and, and thinks that, and it might just be because that person has a different perspective. Like mm -hmm. I said, you know, they, they probably don't go around thinking that they really can heal everyone, but, you know, it's whether God chooses to do it or not. Right. And in the same way, like, we would just pray, you know, God heal this person, and God would choose to do that. Mm -hmm. So kind of looking at it the same way, you know, if, if I pray that this person gets better and then God does heal them, one person might say, oh, well, I was able to heal that person. Right. And the other person might just say, well, I prayed to God and God healed him. But right. they're kind of talking about the same event, just one <laughs> is doing it with maybe a little bit more confidence mm -hmm. than another person would. But right. I think in either situation, God is the one who does the healing. And right. you know, I'm, I'm glad that we you know, talked about that you know, miracles can and, and do still happen. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think I, I do see the points you're talking about that it seems like it's a little bit different than how it was with the way that the apostles did it. Right. The Bible seems to indicate it was a little bit more like authority in the way that they did it. Right. You know? um, so th that was just the other comment yeah. I had. And they did have authority. They, they had the authority that was de delegated to them through Jesus. And so I'd also say for, for people who think that their prayers are um, miraculous, okay, what happens when you pray for somebody and they die? Because everybody we pray for does not get better. So if you felt you had the ability to heal, but then you pray for this person and they die, okay, what does that say about your, your healing ability? So we have to recognize it is within God's will. We pray that God's will be done. We, we tend to think what we want is God's will. And there are times where God shows us that's not your will is not my will. And now we have to wrestle with accepting God's decision on this thing. Yeah, real quick, because I know it's uh, 1040, but like when you brought up like the, we pray for people when they die, mm -hmm. you know, my mind thinks differently now. It's like, why does that four-year-old baby that, you know, was doing perfectly fine, bringing so much joy to the parent's life, just one day wake up and the baby's dead? And, you know, I have to start thinking, because we could easily get mad, right? Oh, man, th this God is not, you know, where is he? My baby. Right. And I had to start thinking, like, deep, like, I could wake up tomorrow. Well, I could not wake up tomorrow, and that's it. And I had to look and see, okay, when people die, they've, they've served their purpose. So whatever they did in life affected somebody else. If I die today, 
I must have done something that God said, okay, you've reached your point, either you've gone too far the opposite way, or, all right, you did what you needed to do, let's pass the torch on to the next person, come on up, you know, be amongst your brothers and sisters when the time comes. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of think a deeper meaning, like, you know, let's just enjoy life, and when it's over, we served our purpose, mm -hmm. some, somehow. Right. Okay. What's your hand up? You just discussed. Okay, in agreement. Okay, uh, Matthew, saw your hand. Matthew, Matthew's hand's up. Okay. And then this will be the last uh, comment. I just wanted, when Todd was speaking, that there's a passage that came to me. I was trying to remember where, but just says that when we pray, we pray um, that God's will, mm -hmm. that we ask according to his will. Mm -hmm. And I find that that helps us to simplify, well, me, to mm -hmm. simplify the prayer to know that, hey, just ask God for his will to be done. And so, uh, why don't you lead us in our closing prayer? Let us pray. Great God, we are so thankful to you for this day. Another chance at life, another chance to learn more about you and to be better workers in your kingdom. Mm -hmm. We thank you for the session we just had. Continue to thank you for our teacher and his desire to teach. Pray, oh God, that you would be with him, be with us as a congregation, be with us as we are in this new area, and that as we go out into the fields to work for you. Be with us as we go into the next session, as we pray through Christ's name. Amen.